I'm Miss Williams, and you are Walking Through World History with Williams. Chapter 14, Recap End Causes Leading to World War I this lecture is all about recapping the last two units and also setting you up for next week, which is World War I. This slide should look familiar to you. It is the Agricultural Revolution slide. That is when we talked about how wealthy landowners brought out local farms, um, and created big giant farms. They experimented with more productive seeding and harvesting methods leading to a larger crop yield. This larger crop yield benefited society because when there's a lot of crops produced, the prices can be lowered. The prices being lowered, people don't have to worry about food. They can afford it. When people can afford food, they are happy. They're eating good. They tend to get their jams on. When they get their jams on, babies are made. <laughs> this caused a baby boom. Well, it was so many babies made that they needed products to be made quickly. And during this time, people made stuff by hand. So sewing a pair of pants or outfit would take forever. So entrepreneurs started to experiment with technology and this moved us into the industrial revolution and it is the industrialization is the process of developing machine production of goods the industrial revolution refers to the greatly increased output of machine made goods in the middle of the 1700s it if you call if you recall it began in england why because england had large population which was great because they needed workers for these factories that were being created. They had extensive, extensive natural resources, such as water, power, and coal to fuel the machines, iron ore to construct machines and tools, and rivers for transportation, transportation to get the items to and from quickly. They had an expanding economy, highly developed banking system arose, political stability. And if you recall in the original lecture, I mentioned that Britain actually, actually started to trade with the United States because they had cotton. So their economies was intertwined during this time. It began to be intertwined. This is how most alliances began. Okay, and we're going to talk about alliances in a little while. From the industrial, industrial Revolution, it led us to imperialism. Why? Because imperialism is when larger com countries dominate or control smaller or submissive countries. And imperialism began because of the Industrial Revolution because, hey, they had these entrepreneurs, they had these products, and it, unlike how we are today where we have like two or three of everything, they didn't really buy things like that. So entrepreneurs wanted to keep their business going. So they either ha they had to go out and find other countries to sell their product to or, and or, they needed to find countries that had the resources they needed to continue to make their product. And this is when imperialism started taking place that um, we talked about the scramble for Africa and um, also Asian countries being dominated during this time for their resources um, a major reason was social Darwinism that they used to justify survival to fittest um, they looked at African and Asian civilizations as inferior civilizations and um, there is a video that you will watch today on about social Darwinism. So this is a, a, a short recap of the relationship between agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, and imperialism. 
Now, imperialism, because these countries are grabbing and claiming this land, there's tensions rising because other countries list may want the same land. So this is going to cause other issues, and this leads us to the causes that led to World War One. Now, I'm actually going to play an a old video of me lecturing in class because I cover I thought the lecture was pretty um good. I tried to recreate it um and it it just didn't have the same effect. So just for raw the sometimes the the video will stop but you're not missing anything. For some reason it was a lag when I re recorded it. So please watch this video about the causes that led to World War One. Okay, so we're going to talk about the four factors that led to World War One. Now, what was the last chapter we talked about? Uh, what was chapter 27 all about? <laughs> imperialism. 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 What exactly was imperialism? Oh. What? Taking a, I want to say taking a country by force, using your military power, and like making the nation part of your nation, like colonizing. Colonizing. When a dominant... A big or a dominant country takes over a more um, submissive country, right? And we talked about the different types of imperialism. Um, why? What was their motive? What was their motive? Oh, oh no. There's more than one person. Brianna. To get more resources. To get more resources, or we talked about about two ways industrialization related to. Imperialism. So to get more resources was one. What was the other? Oh. Strategic location for resources or? To sell to others. I'm sorry? To sell to others. Sell to others. So that means they needed more consumers. Right? Yeah. So imperialism is one. Imperialism is the first factor, right? And we talked about the um, various issues that could arise with imperialism. What was the conference to kind of keep the, these issues from rising? The Berlin. the Berlin Conference. And somebody tell me what was that conference about? The European splitting up African lands. The European splitting up African lands. And it's kind of like a scramble for Africa. I claim it, therefore I let you guys know, and this is mine, and then we could avoid war, right? Um, we also talked about imperialism in other places outside of Africa, um, other Asian nations that actually fail to imperialism as well. Okay, so imperialism is the first factor. Why? Because countries, let's think if I wanted, let's say I wanted Kenya. I wanted Kenya, but Jalen has Kenya already. That's not cool. I want Kenya, though. I want that land. So do you guys see how tension can start to rise yeah. over land that one country claimed that another country may want or need because they have the resources or the people? Um, yes? yes, because remember, they needed more people to sell to or resources to help continue to make their products during industrialization, the industrialization period. All right, another factor. Alliances, system of alliances. What exactly is an alliance? Taylor, you want to give it a guess? Not quite. Amari, alliance. What do you think alliance is? Not sure. Daquan. Like a team. It's a team. Kind of like a team, right? I like to I like to compare it to your high school issues. Okay? If we fight, if I fight, we all gonna fight. Okay? So let's say Anaya. Anaya is my bestie. We here. Hey girl. We here. Anaya is my bestie. 
And she's my ride to and from school. She hooks me up so I don't have to wait in the snow. Anaya, she got me. Well, Maya, Maya doesn't like Anaya. Maya's been talking mad crap about Anaya. Now, I don't have anything against Maya. Maya's fine. No issues. But if Maya messes with Anaya, my rides to and from school could be interrupted. I can't have that. So guess what, Maya? If you mess with Anaya, you mess with me. Simple? You think it's simple. But this is the thing that we're not realizing. Taylor and Maya are like this. So that means if we mess with Maya, Taylor's going to have to get involved. Because they're science fair projects, and she, she can't risk Maya not being here for the science fair. So now you have something that started between Anaya and Maya, and now it's four people involved. You see the issues with alliances? The real world example. Now we're going to bring it back to history, okay? Remember when we were talking about industrialization, and I told you that America and Britain were, their economies were getting intertwined because of cotton? Remember the, the textile industries? And I said how now that their economies are intertwined, they care about what happens. Because just like the example, if Anaya gets in, um, kicked out of school, I'm not going to have a ride. Well, if Britain goes to war, that's going to mess with them buying my cotton, American cotton. So therefore, it's going to mess with my economy. I can't have that. So now, if Britain goes to war, America's going to have to go to war because we are together. We are allies. We are allies in Congress where our economies are connected. Therefore, this is one of the factors, system of alliances, okay? Do you guys understand how the world war is about to happen, world war? You guys see how it turned in from like two to three to like everyone? It's the web of alliances. Militaryism. Militaryism. Anybody want to give it a guess what that is? Anybody want to guess? Yes, Tamaya. Is it due to like, um, battles or US It has some to do with battles, ultimately. Miss Pew. <laughs> no? You want to give it a guess? Richard, militaryism. Why don't you guess for me? Give it a try. Making of a military by forceful means, not, not necessary, not necessarily, but it is the making of a military. And I guess I cannot explain militarism unless I bring in the last factor, which is nationalism. <coughs> okay? The last factor, which is nationalism. So we'll go back to militarism. Let's talk about nationalism. Anybody remember when we talked about nationalism? You had a project about it? Anybody? It's like almost like patriotism, but like you like it's like having a lot of faith in your country or something. Having a lot of faith in your country, strong devotion to your country. Um, let's just call it like it is. Thinking your country is the best country ever, right? Mm -hmm. So, what makes a country the best country? If you had to give it some form of definition or what 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 would make the best country, Richard? I guess like the greatest. Uh, first of all, like the greatest types of food, the greatest types of uh, arts and culture, uh, army stuff like that. Okay, I agree. Anybody else want to add? Come on, wake up, people. I know seven fifty one in the morning, but I'm popping. Mackenzie, you want to add? People standing together, so you have united to a certain extent. 
Um, social Darwinism kind of plays a part into this. <coughs> Anybody understand why social Darwinism would play a part? They, they think that the country's the, the best fit for survival. Remember, can somebody remind me, Grant, what is social Darwinism again? Um, the use of Darwin's like, survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest applied to? Um, race. Race, human beings, right? Okay, so you have this nation that thinks that everybody wants to be the best possible nation. Well, does the best possible, possible nation, would they get punked? I mean, I know that's like not a historical term, but come on. Will they get pumped? If they're the best, no. If they're the best, are they going to get pumped? No, they're going to be the one, if anything, doing the punking, right? And how can one, a nation, punk other nations? How can nations punk other nations? Having the biggest, oh. baddest military, navy. Hey, I got ships for days. You ain't, you don't want none of this. We got guns for days. You don't want none of this. We got soldiers for days. Militarism was when all the countries were trying to have the biggest and the best military. So they will not get pumped. Because if they're going to be the best nation ever, they got to be able to hold it down and prove that they're the best nation ever if it comes down to it. You following me? Any, any questions so far? Now, militarism did something. Now, during the whole imperialism period, remember I told you a lot of tensions? Because people may want land that you already claimed and vice versa. Well, for a long time, the thing that kept them from going to war was militarism. People's military. I don't know about you, but if I see, and I know this is wrong, so no, this is just an example. Don't make me go viral. If I see a little shrimp person, and they're talking mad crap, I'm going to walk up to them with no problem. Move out my way. Go, go somewhere, sit down, get out of my face. You're coming at me wrong. Well, if I know that little shrimp person yes. carry the knife and have the gun, they can be like, move. And I'm going to be like, okay. <laughs> that's fine. And that pretty much comes down to the whole military aspect. A lot of nations knew that other nations had the military, they had the Navy, and they knew even though they were building up their Navy, and their Navy might have been equal to them, they really don't want to go to war. Because if you know that someone has an equal Navy, it's a possibility of what? You can lose. That is called mutually assured destruction. Acronym MAD. I see you looking, but no one's writing it down. Mutually assured destruction. If I have 20 guns and Mackenzie has 20 guns and we get out of, we get into a shootout, what's most likely gonna happen to both of us? We're both gonna die, right? And mutually assured destruction is pretty much what everybody was kind of holding tight. They were kind of like, okay, let's. Let's not go to war. Let's try to be peaceful. Let's try to keep everything neutral. We may not like them. They may have the resources we want. They may have the land that we want. But we also know they're about that life. And we're about that life. But they're about that life. OK? Any questions so far? Yes. Mutually, you mean the the mutually assured destruction. Mutually assured destruction. And, and assured means definite. Mutual is both, okay? Mutually assured destruction. 
So now that you have my little lead into the lecture, I will now turn it on to the regular notes, okay? But does everybody understand the foundation going in? You understand how these four things actually ultimately lead to World War I? No questions whatsoever. Okay, can you stop the film, please? Okay, so you watched the video, the first two videos. So you should know the relationship between the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, and imperialism. You should have a firm understanding of each cause or each factor that led to World War I. And now I have two supplemental videos that if you have time in class, um, please continue the video along that breaks down social Darwinism a little bit more and it talks about the alliances prior to the war because well, next week we're going to just go into the war so this is a good video to have that foundation just going in hopefully you understand if you have any questions please feel free to ask your um, teacher and I'll see you next week for World War One. During 1865 to the 1900s Social Darwinism was used significantly to encourage human competition, to oppose intervention in the natural human order, and was the idea that humans compete for the struggle of existence. Charles Darwin, an English naturalist and geologist, contributed much of his research to the theory of natural selection, also known as survival of the fittest. While many social Darwinists saw competition among different individuals and groups as an ordinary component of human evolution, it was also used politically to advocate laissez-faire capitalism, political conservatism, imperialism, racism, and to discourage reform and intervention. The main idea of social Darwinism is that the status and privileges enjoyed by the wealthy and powerful members of society are the result of their personal characteristics and traits evolving through natural selection. Those who did not possess these traits were found to be powerless and poor members of society, and it was widely believed that it would be best for the human race to let these individuals and groups struggle for survival and later fall out of existence. The belief that the small percentage of the wealthy at the top were the more evolved class of people was significantly advocated by Herbert Spencer, William Graham Sumner, and Andrew Carnegie. Herbert Spencer argued that social programs designed to aid poor people worked against nature. In support of Herbert Spencer's belief, William Graham Sumner, a liberal American social scientist, believed that the humans who were the most fit became the most successful. Whoever had the necessary skills to prosper would be the ones who would rise to the top. This included brains, talent, and hard work. In agreement with both Herbert Spencer and William Graham Sumner, Andrew Carnegie applied Darwin's survival of the fittest to society by arguing that a free market economy and non-interference by the government would allow for the fittest to evolve. The richest men in the country at the time, also known as the robber barons, were perfect examples of this idea. Men like Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, and Vanderbilt came to power through their wise investments in the economy and later controlled a large part of it. Through hard work and perseverance, Andrew Carnegie embodies a true rags-to-riches story and is the true definition of social Darwinism. He came to the United States as a poor immigrant who used his connections and investments to work his way up the social ladder and into the robber barons as a successful owner of the Carnegie Steel Company. J.P. Morgan, an American financer and banker, was another man who greatly believed in the idea of social Darwinism. John D. Rockefeller, the richest man in American history, as well as a founder of the Standard Oil Company, believed that the growth of a large business is merely a survival of the fittest. Cornelius Vanderbilt created a ferry service at a young age, which would make him into one of the richest men in America. Furthermore, social Darwinists believed that the weaker members of a species in nature would die, and that over time only the stronger genes would survive and be passed on. Social Darwinists believed the same evolution should happen with humans. This led them to oppose government handouts, safety regulations, and laws restricting child labor. Such actions would help the weak to survive, which would be unfit to natural selection. In short, Herbert Spencer, William Graham Sumner, and Andrew Carnegie, along with most if not all Darwinists, believed that they were rich and empowered because they were superior human beings in the evolution process. 
The First World War is often interpreted as fought between two major alliances, the Triple Entente between France, Britain and Russia, and the Dual Alliance linking Germany and Austria-Hungary. But this oversimplifies the alliances, treaties and agreements that developed throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries and drew the great powers, along with numerous other countries, into war. Between 1887 and 1914, Europe was transformed from a system in which well-balanced forces maintained a delicate equilibrium to one polarised by two hostile alliance networks. In 1887, it was inconceivable that a crisis in Austro-Serbian relations could have led to a continental war, but by 1914, that was exactly what happened. The Treaty of London, created in 1839, guaranteed the sovereignty of Belgium which had broken away from the United Kingdom of the Netherlands in 1830. Its signatories were Great Britain, Austria, France, the German Confederation, Russia and the Netherlands. A guarantee of Belgium's neutrality was also brokered by Britain. While Germany later disregarded the treaty, Britain went to war with the claim that they were upholding Belgium's neutrality. Forty years later, on October 7, 1879, the dual alliance between Germany and Austria-Hungary was signed in Vienna. Each pledged the other support in the event one was invaded by Russia and guaranteed neutrality should one be invaded by another major European power. Italy joined to form the Triple Alliance in 1882, but reneged on its commitment once war broke out in 1914. Germany also signed the Reinsurance Treaty with Russia in June 1887. Tensions between Russia and Austria-Hungary over competing interests in the Balkans compelled Germany's Iron Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, to move to prevent Russia forming an alliance with France. This secret treaty guaranteed that each country would remain neutral should the other be attacked by a third power, unless Russia were to attack Austria-Hungary or Germany to attack France. Berlin also promised to support Russian objectives in the Turkish Straits. The treaty expired in 1890 when Bismarck's successor, Leo von Caprifi, feared it would provoke the Ottoman and British empires. The Triple Alliance and the failure to renew a treaty with Germany had left Russia vulnerable, while France had been isolated in Europe since its defeat in the 1870-1871 Franco-Prussian War. France began to invest in Russian infrastructure from 1888 and the two formed the Franco-Russian alliance on January 4, 1894. It was to remain in place for as long as the Triple Alliance existed, and stipulated that if one of the countries of the Triple Alliance attacked France or Russia, its ally would attack the aggressor in question, and that if a Triple Alliance country mobilised its army, France and Russia would mobilise. The next major agreement in Europe came about with the Entente Cordiale in April 1904. Having been involved in three rounds of talks with Germany between 1898 and 1901, Britain decided not to join the Triple Alliance. When the Russo-Japanese War was about to erupt, France and Britain found themselves being dragged into the conflict on the side of their respective allies. France was allied with Russia, while Britain had recently signed the Anglo-Japanese Alliance. In order to avoid war, the sides negotiated a treaty that settled many long-standing issues particularly their differences in Africa over British control of Egypt and French control of Morocco. The agreement marked the end of nearly a thousand years of intermittent conflict between the two countries. The final substantial agreement came in 1907 with the so-called Triple Entente between Britain, France and Russia, thereby firming their stance against the Triple Alliance. But in reality, there was no Triple Entente. The 1907 treaty was specifically between Britain and Russia to stop their rivalry in Central Asia. After Russia's defeat to Japan in 1905, it seemed that Russia no longer posed a threat to Britain's Indian interests and there was no three-way agreement as there was with the Triple Alliance. 